Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here this evening. Uh, my name is Leonie Watson. Um, I'm not a developer. I'm definitely not an Ember developer. Uh, what I am is an accessibility engineer. Uh, that means I spend a lot of time pulling apart code to find out why it doesn't work in the browser or with assistive technologies like screen readers that translate content on screen into synthetic speech. Once I hopefully have figured out what's going wrong, I try to find solutions, file bugs, and work with various people to find ways to make things better. So what I'd like to talk to you today about is uh, accessibility mechanics. Uh, a lot of accessibility is kind of soft science. It's, it's about user interaction, it's very subjective, but a huge amount of accessibility actually is pretty cold-blooded code level stuff. Uh, and I'd like to explain to you kind of how a lot of that works, how actually a lot of accessibility happens without you really needing to do anything at all, um, and at the end of it, look at some Ember examples that hopefully demonstrate uh, some of the ways you can uh, use and test for better accessibility. So the first thing I want to touch on is HTML. It'll be really familiar to all of you. But a question, how much do you know about what HTML is really doing for you uh, when you use it in the way that it was originally intended to be used? Well, when you use HTML, pretty much every element you choose to use has a role that defines its purpose. Uh, paragraphs, tags, whatever the element you may uh, choose to use, uh, it has a role that tells us what that thing, what that piece of content is supposed to do. So for an example, uh, if you use the image element, the IMG element, uh, that has a role of graphic or image. Uh, it's pretty evident visually on screen when uh, a graphic is displayed, but if you use a screen reader because you can't see what's on screen, then the role is what tells uh, a visually impaired person that they're dealing with some graphical content uh, in their web page or web application. We have things in HTML like uh, main as an element that defines the main content area of the page. Actually, from a visual point of view or a structural point of view, uh, it's not that important to use this particular element. Uh, you could just as easily use a div. But from an accessibility point of view, knowing that this element represents the main content area, and as a blind computer user, having that information communicated to you is incredibly important because it's the equivalent of information that you can see on screen just by looking at the page and assessing its kind of overall layout and structure. There are a couple of exceptions to the rule, of course. Div and span elements don't really have particularly strong roles. Uh, so if you were to put some content into a span or a div, uh, it would pretty much just end up being plain text. So no matter how much scripting and styling you throw at some divs and spans to a screen reader looking at the code, it's still just going to be some pretty neutral content there. Uh, and that's a key theme in accessibility, and it's going to come back again um, when you think about this in terms of Ember and, and other JavaScript frameworks as well. When you use HTML, you'll find that a lot of elements have a name or an accessible name. Like the names of people, uh, an accessible name is what differentiates one thing from another of its kind in a web application interface. So, for example, if we use a, a link, an anchor element, uh, the content of the link becomes its accessible name, the text or the graphic with an alt text in the middle of it. Uh, visually, that's how you tell one link apart from another on a page. A screen reader will use that same content to do exactly the same job for someone who isn't able to see. If you're a speech recognition user and you use voice input, uh, then you can use that accessible name to target the link in order to click on it. Uh, accessible names can also come from attributes, so if you have an image on the page, then using the alt attributes and giving it a sensible uh, text equivalent for the image, that text equivalent becomes the accessible name. So a screen reader user uh, knows what differentiates this image from another. In this case, we're imagining a bottle of tequila and the alt text is Chimuko's tequila. Uh, again, you know, if you are using other forms of assistive technology, you can identify that image using this information. You can also get an accessible name uh, by association with another element. So if you use a, a pretty standard input, text input, and you associate a label element with it using the for and ID attribute pairing, uh, the text content of the label becomes the accessible name for the form field. 
So again, if you're using a speech recognition tool, you could just say, focus on the username field. Uh, call it by name, just like we people do. You also get information about state if you use HTML. Uh, an obvious one is the required attribute that you can put onto form fields. Uh, visually, it changes the UI to indicate that the field is necessary before the form can be submitted. But again, programmatically, that information is available to screen readers that can communicate it to someone who can't see the changes to the visual UI. Oh. Uh, you also get a uh, keyboard focus thrown in for free when you use HTML. So, for example, if you use an anchor element, the browser will automatically make it possible to tab onto it so that you can use it. And it'll also know that if you hit the enter key, you're going to activate the link. You don't have to do anything as a developer other than use the anchor to get that uh, functionality in place. Similarly, if you use a button element, it can be focused on with the keyboard. The browser takes care of that for you. And in the case of buttons, the expected interaction with a keyboard is either the space or the enter keys. And again, you get that for free by the browser when you just use the right HTML element for the job. So how does this all hang together? Well, when you throw some code into a browser, the browser creates the document object model, the DOM tree. It's a hierarchical representation of all the objects in the interface, and you can manipulate them, change them, add stuff, take stuff away. Every time uh, a DOM is created or it's changed in some way, the browser also creates an accessibility tree. And this is another hierarchical model of the interface, but this time it contains information specifically about the accessibility of objects within the interface. Although uh, news hot off the press yesterday is that uh, very soon uh, Edge from Microsoft is going to radically change this model um, and, and, and do something quite revolutionary with it. But for now, um, things are working still pretty much on this two-tier basis. What happens is that on every platform you have an accessibility API. Uh, MSAA or UI automation on uh, Windows platforms, NS Accessibility Protocol on OS X and others on Linux and uh, iOS and Android. And these APIs exist at the operating system, the platform level, so they're inherent in pretty much every kind of interface you get on a system, be it the operating system itself, an application within it, or web content rendered within a browser application. So if you look at uh, a platform control, uh, in this case, it's the checkbox taken from the Windows 10 operating system, uh, and you query it using one of the platform accessibility APIs, the information you hear about this checkbox is its role is a checkbox, its name is bold because that's the text label associated with the checkbox, and its state is focused, focusable, and it's also checked. The interesting thing is that if you were to create exactly the same checkbox using HTML, input with a label, you'd get exactly the same information if you queried it using the same platform accessibility API. And the relationship of this all the way through uh, is mapped by uh, W3C. If you're curious, uh, search for uh, accessibility uh, API mappings and you'll find them for HTML, for core, um, and some new one on the way with SVG as well. ARIA is an interesting technology because it lets you manipulate the information in the browser's accessibility tree. It's a bunch of attributes that you can add to your HTML or SVG uh, and change the accessibility information that the browser makes available. Because as developers, you'll know that it isn't always possible to use the right HTML for the job either because uh, we use frameworks that don't necessarily always uh, do that by default. Uh, sometimes we want to recreate uh, a widget or uh, something that doesn't exist in HTML, like a set of tabs, for example. Uh, sometimes, and increasingly, we're getting into the territory of web components, where actually all we can do is create uh, widgets from primitives like div and span, and where no accessibility natively exists uh, within the components, so we have to build it all in for ourselves. So what ARIA lets you do is use the role attribute to manually define uh, the role of an element that you're using. And there are 30, more than 30 roles now in ARIA 1.1. Uh, roles for things like sliders, dialogues, checkboxes, radio buttons, um, a whole bunch of things. Pretty much every standard uh, application interface control that you can think of, uh, there is a role uh, either in existence or on its way in future versions of the spec.
Uh, there are different ways that you can provide accessible names for elements and also accessible descriptions. The ARIA label and ARIA label by attributes let you provide an accessible name for something. ARIA label takes a string value. ARIA label takes an idref that references some text that exists somewhere else in the application interface. If you need to provide some more information, ARIA describe by is the attribute. And it too takes an idref of uh, information somewhere else in the interface. Uh, and that can just be used to provide some additional hints or uh, extra descriptions if something needs it. And lastly, ARIA lets you explicitly uh, inform the API about states. Uh, there's 20-odd uh, attributes that let you do this. Uh, you have ARIA pressed, ARIA expanded, uh, ARIA checked. Uh, again, most of the common states that you can think about in terms of application interfaces, uh, you can apply manually at an accessibility level with ARIA. So let's take a, a bit of a look at Ember. Now, I will stress again, I'm not an Ember developer, but uh, there are some really good examples out there by some uh, talented and more clever people than myself. And uh, there's a GitHub project that's looking at uh, the accessibility of Ember components. So if you're familiar with uh, Ember.component, uh, it's pretty functionally similar to web components and the custom element specification, although uh, I believe at the moment it doesn't really utilize the shadow DOM in quite the same way that web components do. But you can use uh, Ember.component to create effectively a custom element of your own. So the example on screen uh, is going to create a, ta a tequila button. And it's just going to uh, do some pretty simple uh, thing when it's activated, it's just going to flash up an alert on the screen. Uh, there's really nothing much in here apart from sort of basic uh, Ember component code. What we get on screen uh, if we actually render this button is a tequila button element and it has a tab index of one because uh, that that's what's been put in there by default um, and, and that's pretty much all there is to it. But there are some fundamental problems with this code and if I can get some volume, hopefully, good to go. You look good. <laughs> okay, hang on, let me go back in and see if I can. Is that playing again? Huh? One more. Tab is reposado to kill look good. <laughs> Thank you. So the tab is just the echo of the key that was being hit by the screen reader. And all it said is, is Reposado tequila good? Well, that's fine. It's what's represented on screen in terms of text. But there's no information there from the screen reader user's point of view to say that it was a button. So there's no cue that you can actually interact with this thing. Uh, if you were to go back and look at the code for this Ember component, you'd also have noticed that although click functionality was defined, uh, no keyboard interaction was provided. The other catch in this is that although tab index was used to make the thing itself focusable with a keyboard, it had a positive integer value. It was a value of one. Uh, that means that wherever this button sat in the interface, it would be the first thing to receive tab focus, uh, which you know, if it happened to be some way down through the interface and you started off at the top of the page and you hit tab and the first thing you got to was kind of miles away, uh, that would be really quite disorienting if you were a keyboard user. The basic problem we've got here is that as far as the accessibility APIs are concerned, the tequila button doesn't exist. In other words, it's just like using a span or a div. It has no role, has no particular accessible name. It's got no keyboard focus or interaction thrown in for free. It's pretty inert in every respect as far as accessibility goes. Good news is we can do some things about that. We can amend this uh, Ember component so that it does a whole bunch of things. We're going to use it to apply the ARIA role of button. So from a screen reader user's point of view and the API level, this will now be a button. It won't be a button in any other sense. So in the DOM, this will still be our tequila button element. But at the accessibility level, screen readers and other ATs will also know that it's a button. Uh, we're going to use the ARIA label attribute to make sure that the button has a proper label. Now, the label is Reposado Tequila Good. was working pretty well in the previous example, but this is just belt and braces to really make sure that it's available to assistive technologies. We're going to change the tab index from 1 to 0. Uh, tab index with 0 will just place this button into the tab sequence of the page based on its location in the DOM. So it's a very natural way to add keyboard focus to something. 
And lastly, we're going to add in some keyboard interaction, which mimics the information uh, I mentioned earlier on in the presentation, that you can activate this tequila button using either the space or the enter keys. So coupled with the visual styling, uh, hopefully now, what we end up with is a button that has all of these elements mapped into it. So the role of button, the ARIA label to provide that. And behind it, all the scripting that should make this now functional with a keyboard and with a screen reader. And if I can have some volume again. Good. Tab is reposado tequila good button. Enter dialogue yes, OK button. Enter is reposado tequila good button. So now we have a whole bunch more information. We know it's a button, so a user who isn't able to see the visual styling that makes it look like a button, knows that it's a button and therefore can expect some kind of interaction. Better still, if you use it with the enter or the space key, you actually get something working, uh, a dialogue in this case, uh, which you can then shut down. And the last piece of the puzzle is that focus returns to the button that triggered the alert in the first place. So you don't have to kind of go searching back to find your place on the page. So what can you do to kind of get some of your own Ember stuff um, up to scratch in terms of accessibility? Uh, Jamie was telling me earlier that there's a growing concerted effort to look at accessibility within Ember and make it more integrated. And uh, they're looking at a whole bunch of tools, uh, a couple of which I'm going to mention uh, just now. The first is a set of test suites that are available on GitHub. Um, uh, they're really easy to install. You can just uh, use your Ember command line to install the uh, A11Y test suites. If you're not familiar with the term, A11Y is a, a truncated version of the word accessibility. There are 11 characters between the A and Y, much like I18N and internationalization came about because simply trying to fit accessibility into a tweet is uh, an extra impossible if you want to say anything useful about it. So uh, you can run a full test suite uh, doing this. You can just put it inside an assertion, uh, run the full tests. I think there's uh, maybe 10 or 11 different tests available at the moment. Uh, run them inside the assertion, and it'll just uh, punch out information uh, to let you know whether each one has passed or failed. Uh, occasionally, it'll throw stuff out to the console if you need it. But it's pretty basic, um, but it has some really useful tests in there. You can also uh, run individual tests. So uh, for example, the individual test here is uh, asking whether uh, all actionable elements are focusable. Coming back to that keyboard focus I was talking about earlier. If you want something to do something, it's really important you can actually focus on it first before you can even hope to use it with a keyboard. And that's what this particular suite will test for. There are other tests that will look for things like alternative descriptions or accessible names on images, the same for labels on forms. Uh, there's one that will check for color contrast, some more that will look for keyboard interaction, another that will look for ARIA roles. So it's, uh, it's not a comprehensive test suite, but there's some certainly really good stuff in there to, to help you narrow down some key accessibility issues. There's another API called Tinon. Uh, it's developed by my friend and colleague at uh, the Paciello group where I work uh, called Carl Groves. Uh, it's an API. It has a, a web application interface. So you can go and throw code or URLs at it directly. But as an API, you can also uh, integrate it into your uh, development and build processes, which is really, to my mind, where it comes into its own. Uh, you can uh, install a, a Tinon module. Uh, there's a link through when I share the slides. Uh, there are modules available for Grunt, for Gulp, uh, a whole bunch of other things. There's also a Node module that you can use as the starting point for building your own plugins. There isn't at present uh, an Ember specific one, but uh, it wouldn't take uh, too much uh, work to turn the, the base Node module into uh, an Ember plugin. Uh, you need to throw it two required parameters. Uh, that's your API key and the URL of the source to be tested. Uh, Tinon is a paid for project product, but it's incredibly reasonably priced. Um, uh, unlike many of the accessibility tools out there, they price things uh, for individuals as well as large companies. So it's, uh, it's not an unreasonable uh, kind of level that it's pitched at. It also recommends uh, taking a URL as the source to be tested. You can throw it code directly, but what Tinon does, unlike many other accessibility testing tools, is actually uh, use a headless browser. So it absolutely replicates the experience of the DOM, the accessibility tree, and the assistive technology. Um, many accessibility tools will just scrape the DOM without really going anywhere near the accessibility tree. So that's why you quite often get uh, misreadings or, or unreliable results. <coughs> 
Uh, you can throw out some optional parameters as well. Uh, you can um, ask for a certainty level. So with accessibility, as I said, sometimes things can seem to be a little bit of a, a gray area. Uh, Tenon will return a certainty level and you can set that. So you know, only return uh, issues that are 75% certainty is actually being you know, a big problem for users. Uh, you can set priorities as well. You can also uh, choose which level of the guidelines you're testing against uh, the web content accessibility guidelines being the most commonly used. Um, interesting, you can also set the viewport. So this is really useful if you're testing responsive designs as well because you can just throw it screen resolutions and uh, it'll test whichever version uh, comes out based on, on the response breakpoints that you want to test to. There's another tool um, I'm just going to mention very briefly, um, which is Ember uh, uh, Axe. Uh, it's an open source tool. Uh, it's a plugin and again an API that you can incorporate into your development cycles. Uh, functions very similarly to uh, Tenon's API uh, because it's open source. Uh, there isn't a price tag attached to it, uh, and again, it's developed by a, a bunch of people, as is Tenon, who really understand accessibility. These guys have, have worked in accessibility for many years and. Uh, uh, and they're both extremely good tools and worth checking out. The last thing you can do is actually just test it yourself. You don't need to be an accessibility expert to try and get accessibility right. Actually, far from it. So what can you do? Uh, you can just abandon your mouse or your trackpad. Um, go and see what you can accomplish with your Ember applications with your keyboard. See what you can focus on and what you can't, what you can activate and what you can't. And uh, then just start fixing some stuff. If you uh, have a Mac, hit Command F5. You'll turn on an integrated screen reader in your computer, so you'll get the synthetic speech experience. You won't be able to use it like a regular uh, screen reader user. Don't worry about that, but just play around with it and get a feel for it. And remember, Control will stop it talking, and Command F5 will turn it off again, because I've come across lots of people who've turned it on and not been able to turn it off again. It's not that good. Um, in your browser, um, just try zooming in on stuff, whether you're on a, a mobile, a tablet, um, or, or on your desktop or laptop computer. Just go find the zoom uh, capability. Control++ does it on most platforms. Whack it up to the maximum amount of zoom level, like somebody who's partially sighted might well do, and, and see how your layouts respond, and again, whether you can still get to all the functionality on the page. If you can just do a few things like that every time you develop something or make an update and hopefully do your best to fix them, trust me, you'll be well on your way to making things a hell of a lot better in terms of accessibility. Um, people often think that with accessibility you need to be perfect, and you really don't. Perfect's the enemy of good, whatever you're talking about. Just try and make a couple of things better, and trust me, um, somebody somewhere will be very, very happy that you did. That's me done. Thank you very much. <laughs>
make my applications more accessible is, is there, some, is there, is there ever a case where you're, there's too much chatter? Like, in other words, you, let's say you're using a, a button element which already is self-descriptive, but then you also add the area, uh, aria tagging for role. Is it, does it start to become noisy when you, when you do too much, or is that not an issue and you should not worry about that? It can do, but that's quite a refined um, sort of level of thinking, if that makes sense. Um, I mean, the, the specific example you gave, if you use ARIA label on a button that already has um, a text label, uh, the, there is such a thing called the accessible name and description computation. Uh, and it's like the worst game of trumps you ever came across. It's <laughs> horrible. Um, but it basically says, you know, if, if, you've got, if you've got a text label in a thing, then um, it'll use that unless there's a title attribute, unless blah, blah, blah. And ARIA trumps everything, basically. So in theory, in that respect, you'd only get one label read no matter how many times you applied it. But, but in a wider level, yes, too much noise it, it can be a thing. I wouldn't let that slow you down too much because you can always stop a screen reader from talking to you if you need to. So it's, I'd say it's better to try and maybe make things a little bit too noisy sometimes than not try and not have it work at all. I have one unrelated question, which is uh, I was in the US last week and I bought an Amazon Echo. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I want to play around with it. I don't know if there are any, uh, well, it doesn't have to be the Echo, to be honest with you, but uh, in the voice recognition category, is mm -hmm. there Anything that's that's uh, kind of exciting, interesting that people could tap into uh, relatively easily. Uh, in terms of the speech recognition, um, the Web Speech API is pretty cool, um, which lets you bring speech recognition functionality into your web apps directly. Uh, not. I'm not suggesting you do this as a replacement for those tools themselves, but actually in terms of the capability, that's that's quite exciting. Microsoft's got some really good stuff coming out. Um, uh, of its conference last month in terms of its intelligence API and its bots, um, in terms of sort of speech capture and recognition, um, image identification and a whole bunch of other stuff like that. So yeah, there's, there's a few different exciting things at the moment. How are you getting on with the Echo? I, I like it, but I, 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 I'm a newbie, so I, I, I don't know. I, I'm going to scratch the surface. Right. There you go. Uh, about accessibility on the W3C, I know that this Area 1.1 spec is in being built. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is the main focus for the areas that are not covered well enough in 1.0 and is being improved? 1 .1? Uh, so 1.1, 1 .1, um, it's just a point upgrade, so it's not a huge uh, evolution. Um, there's an attribute uh, called ARIA current, um, which is going to be a way to identify the current link within a set of navigation. Um, usually we do this visually with CSS and that's fine, but again, that's not available to screen readers. Um, so we go through all sorts of strange methods to try and make that information available using hidden text and, and other things, whereas this attribute will do that a lot more neatly. Um, there's some uh, attribute looking at keyboard shortcuts. So if you, you provide shortcuts uh, like uh, some of the scripted uh, applications do like Twitter, for example, or Facebook, um, you can uh, let a screen reader know that that's coming. Uh, there's a few new roles as well, but nothing sort of really earth shaking. I think the, the really exciting stuff is going to come with 2.0 uh, when we're going to look at the extensibility of ARIA. So coming back to the idea of web components and custom elements, what happens if you want to create something that doesn't exist? Um, it won't be possible to choose from a, you know, a, a predefined set of ARIA roles because you'll be dreaming up something new for the first time. So how do we make ARIA extensible so it can tap into the web component space? <laughs> uh, SVG, well, yeah, I mean, so yeah, in 2.0, we're going to get the, um, uh, well, SVG 2.0 is going to have a whole bunch of uh, ARIA capability in it as well. You can, you can use some ARIA at the moment with SVG, although it'll chuck a wobble if you try using a, a validator or a conformance uh, checker for it. Um, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that's just landed in WebKit uh, behind the flag that will make um, a lot more of the semantic information of uh, SVG. Uh, available using ARIA as well. Something like, I don't know, in SVG there is a person, you can give a name to the head or something? Uh, so in SVG uh, yeah. it'll do mapping, so for example the SVG uh, element itself will map to a group role because it contains a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, the, the graphics elements like rect, circle will map to uh, an image role because that's essentially what they are. 
um, the title and desk elements already actually map pretty well to accessible name and, and accessible description in, in the APIs. So that's pretty solid already. But uh, yeah, a few bits and pieces like that coming coming along. Maybe, maybe a bunch of stuff sort of charts. I mean, one of the big things for SVG is you know, like Charters and D3 are just doing charts and being able to actually interpret the chart, being able to get information spat out to the user that tells them what's being represented there. So the libraries will be able to produce SVG that's explorable and readable without being you know, following every little line and every little last piece of SVG. I have a, a question. Um, so if you if you are um, implementing a component from a, a visual design, um, would you say it's advisable to look for a, a UI pattern from the operating system that it maps most closely onto so that you can use the appropriate roles? Uh, yes, it's not a bad way to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if you if you look at the mapping guides, um, that's where that information comes in really handy. So um, you, you can look up and yeah. So if you want to create, use a simple example, you know, a checkbox like we had on the screen. Yeah. If you look to the, the, the platform controls and and see what they uh, how they're represented, then yeah, those are generally the, the roles to apply. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to just give everyone an idea of what's going on in Ember regarding mm. accessibility. Uh, so Le Leonie pointed out some of the add-ons that exist currently. Um, new to that stage, there is an org on GitHub that appeared in the last couple of weeks called Ember A11Y. And this will be the consolidation of all the experimentation that's gone on so far, all the things we can learn from other communities, from the standards bodies, from the vendors. Um, so right now, uh, there is one add-on called Ember A11Y, and it's going to pack in a bunch of tools that are uh, particularly tuned to the mechanics of single page applications and <coughs> Ember applications in particular. So um, right now, it gives you a focusing outlet. So if you use an Ember app today and you have a nav which brings some new content in in a new outlet and you click a link in your nav, the screen, re the screen reader will have no idea that new content has appeared and won't be able to announce it to the user. What this does is when new content appears in a focusing outlet, um, the add-on will bring the browser's focus to the first element in that outlet so that the clicking the link flows naturally onto the content that it's introduced. It also handles things like error states appearing in outlets, loading states appearing in outlets. Um, and basically, it, it's um, the intention is that this add-on become part of the default blueprint for the CLI eventually when it's been proven out by the community, as we usually do. And also the intention is that we connect up our efforts with the efforts of people in the Angular community, the React community, like I say, browser vendors and standards bodies. Mm -hmm. So go check it out on GitHub. Uh, there is a topic A11Y channel on the Ember Slack. Go have a look in there as well. Um, there are some great people in there who have all sorts of different experiences in the area. So I think another round of applause for Leonie. Hmm. Thank you.